In this video, we're going to be invading what happens to be the largest true ghost town in America. Pitcher, Oklahoma is the name of this forgotten place. It sits along the Kansas border about a dozen miles west from Missouri. It was September 1st, 2023 when I came through town. I actually made a stop here in Pitcher while driving the entire stretch of Route 66 from Chicago to LA, as Pitcher is only a few minutes away from the main route. It was a beautiful morning, that's for sure. However, during my golden hour drone session of Pitcher, Oklahoma, I was not so beautifully interrupted by one of the few remaining residents. What are you doing? Flying a drone. Huh? Flying a drone. Why? Because I'm making a video. Well, you're on my property. This is public right here. This is the road. I'm not, I'm not going in there. Get a hold of Marshall over there and uh, see if you got uh, authorization to be on football property. Go for it. Yeah, that's enough of that. Let's move on. Actually, you can catch the full sequence of that interaction along with other hijinks and hilarity that occurred on my road trip last summer when I spanned all of Route 66. Plus, it didn't seem like the Qualpaw Marshall cared at all when I drove by later in the day. Nope. Yeah, so, like I said, not important. Doesn't matter. All right, so where I start the driving tour of the ghost town of Pitcher, Oklahoma, is at the Kansas state line, heading south on what used to be the town's main drag. And before we get too far, let's lay out some context. Pitcher has been talked about through various YouTube videos and through national media outlets quite a bit at this point. So there's a lot of people who have heard about Pitcher and know that it's an abandoned lead and zinc mining town. If you don't know, all of the white circular shaped things that you see on the satellite image of the pitcher area would be piles of toxic chat or mining waste from the lead and zinc mines throughout the town. But back to with what I was talking about with how there's been so much coverage of this area through YouTube videos and media outlets. What a lot of these YouTube videos and national media stories will often leave out is things like how pitcher is just one of a handful of ghost towns in this area. That's just one of the many things. Basically, I'm going to be giving you all of the context that all of these other YouTubers and media outlets will leave out of their stories because they probably assume that it's just a bunch of boring crap to the audience, but not me because it's actually really interesting. Meanwhile, you're starting to see why this place is so fascinating to so many people. You're starting to see why there's been so much coverage of this place because what we're seeing right here is a street that used to be full of shops and businesses and off of this main drag, you had streets that connected to it that were full of homes, but not so much anymore. More context as we go back to the map. Now, it's rather fitting that two different U.S. Highway 69s serve this region, because in a lot of ways, Pitcher kind of screwed itself. Okay, okay, but so did the other ghost towns of Hawkerville, Cardin, Duthat, Zincville, and Trees, Kansas. And that's not all of them, because when you look at certain maps you'll find that there's even more former communities in this area. In fact, a lot of these names that you see on the map were short-lived mining camps, and a lot of the towns that still are here today in this area started as mining camps. Anyway, all of these abandoned towns are now a part of what's called the Tar Creek Superfund site, which, of course, is named after Tar Creek, as it heads right through the middle of all of the mining activity. Tar Creek, as you can imagine, was largely affected by the heavy toxic lead and zinc mining activity. If you go to the pitcher area today, you might find a red color to some of the standing pond and creek water that surrounds this area because it's heavily tainted with lead, zinc, and cadmium. Safe to say that Nestle or Ice Mountain won't be setting up shop in town anytime soon. Well, from this region, Tar Creek feeds into the larger Neosho River near the town of Miami which then feeds into the Grand Lake Reservoir quite a few miles south. And that's a pretty large lake, so it's a popular spot for fishing and boating. But the problem is that there's been proven elevated levels of lead and zinc found in the fish from Grand Lake due to the Pitcher area's long history of hefty mining activity. Lastly, not far from Pitcher, you actually have several functioning towns. For example, downtown Joplin, Missouri is only a half hour to the east of Pitcher, and the entire tri-state region that Pitcher is a part of has a population between 200 and 300,000. So compared to the average area across Kansas and Oklahoma, yeah, Pitcher isn't necessarily as isolated of a town as one might think. 
When you look at some old pictures of Pitcher, this place looked like any normal town with a layout of grid streets. It had a nice concentration of single-family homes filling up the town space. It had commercial businesses and other buildings off the main drag. The only thing that wasn't normal, of course, was the multiple giant piles of chat. Here you can see what the old downtown area looked like before the 2008 tornado came through and ripped out most of everything that remained. More about the tornado later on. Let's start from the beginning of the Pitcher history timeline. The area that Pitcher is in is often referred to as the Tri-State Lead and Zinc District. The yellow boxed area is Oklahoma, the medium shade blue is Kansas, the lighter shade blue is Missouri. The blotches of dark blue scattered throughout the map is where lead and zinc were heavily mined. That being said, what's very noticeable about this map is how the blotch over the Pitcher area is the largest by far and away of all of the dark blue blotches in the tri-state area. The first discovery of zinc and lead in this region was in 1870 near the town of Galena, Kansas, which is just a stone's throw away from the Missouri border. In Oklahoma, the first mines ended up showing up around the present-day town of Peoria, which is about 10 miles southeast of Pitcher. That town ended up being bombarded by the Peoria Mining Land Company from New Jersey. Lead and zinc ore would originally be mined near the town of Peoria before being hauled off by wagon to Missouri for the milling part of it. That being said, the city of Joplin ended up serving as the region's financial, manufacturing, and economic hub for all of the mining activity in the area. In Pitcher, lead and zinc ore deposits weren't discovered until 1913. Pitcher was actually founded that same year as a town that supposedly sprung up overnight. The town was named after Oliver Pitcher, who owned the Pitcher Lead Company. Pitcher was a successful mining entrepreneur from Joplin. Once the deposits in Pitcher were discovered, however, mining activity was busier in Pitcher than what was seen in any other town in this region. Once the deposits in Pitcher were discovered, however, mining activity in Pitcher absolutely exploded, faster than what was seen in any other town in this region. Houses sprung up quickly to house the mining workers, and for whatever reason, whether there was more lead and zinc in Pitcher than what was found in other areas or not, it's well documented that the mines in Pitcher were dug a lot deeper than the mines that we see in the other parts of this region. Concentrating mills and pitcher would separate the crude oil into lead and zinc, which would then result in a lot of metal shavings or tailings that would need to be discarded. And that's why there's so many of these giant piles of chat laying around the town that used to be pitcher. The piles of chat are easily the most visible form of toxicity that the mining activity left behind, but... There are other and less often discussed ways that the environment was contaminated too, as over time when heavy rains have hit the area, the abandoned underground mine shafts would become flooded. Whenever that happened, that would leach acidic metals into the water, which would then threaten the municipal water supply once that water hit the local streams, such as Tar Creek and then the Neosho River. This poisoned water would also leach into the underground aquifer that supplies water for this area. Lead and zinc mining proved to be the leading industry for this tri-state region for a 100-year period from around 1850 to 1950. Now, the land in Oklahoma was and still is owned by the Quapaw tribe. The tribe was able to fight through lawsuits, and according to an 1897 ruling, the Quapaw tribe was able to collect lease payments from these mining companies who were digging up lead and zinc on their land. However, by 1927, there were as many as 248 lead and zinc mills in far northeastern Oklahoma. This activity brought up dozens of mining camps in the area, which explains why we see names like Captain Kansas, Duthot, and Potter. Side note, as a lot of these camps were named after the owner of a small mining company. Well, moving on with the history timeline now, as working in the mines is hard work, and historically across this country, most mining communities from back in the day were full of rowdiness and violence. Pitcher was no exception. Pitcher was actually home to as many as 14,000 people during its peak, which was in the mid-1920s. The town was considered to be overcrowded and unsanitary during that time. Other nearby small towns, such as Quapaw, Miami, and Peoria, 
saw the same type of environments, but none of them were near as extreme as Pitcher was. Anyway, during the peak years of this town's economic mining activity, railroads were plenty in the area. In fact, people were able to live as far away as Carthage, Missouri and commute to Pitcher via train in the early 1900s. And it's not like Carthage is close by. It's actually on the other side of Joplin. In modern times, that's about a 45 minute drive away from Pitcher. So a train commute from Carthage to Pitcher, you know, five days a week or whatever it was, you know, that's quite a hike. That's a long commute. Anyway, once the Great Depression hit in the 1930s, all of this mining activity started to disappear just as fast as it seemingly appeared overnight. There were dozens of small mine owners who started to stop seeing profits. As a result, these smaller mining companies started to consolidate into one larger mining company. There used to be as many as 12 mills in town, but in 1929, consolidation brought them down to just one much larger mill west of Pitcher. At the time, it was the world's largest modern lead and zinc concentrating mill. Not long before that, the area saw peak employment in 1924, where just over 11,000 men worked in Pitcher and the rest of the surrounding mining towns. Production was said to have peaked in 1926, and at that time, Ottawa County, Oklahoma, was where most of the mining activity was held within the tri-state mining area, in which was a region that was accountable for 50% of the zinc and 10% of the lead that was mined in the United States, making it not only the leading lead and zinc mining area in the country, but also across the entire globe. Meanwhile, the lifestyle for these mine workers was described as being very hazardous, with all of the explosions, the mine shaft collapses, accidents, stale and dusty air throughout the town, polluted water, a high concentration of diseases, all of that to receive fairly low wages. The wages were considered to be just enough, however, to own a home in Pitcher and raise a family, and not much more. But yes, times started to get really tough around the Great Depression, just like they did across the rest of this country. So much so that labor strikes started to arise in Pitcher. In the 1950s, labor unions started to successfully recruit members, which is telling because for a long time, labor unions had little to no success in Pitcher. The number of workers in the Pitcher mines went from over 11,000 in the 1920s to being around 4,000 in the 1950s, in which 1,000 of those 4,000 in the 1950s were a part of labor unions. Over time, the mines closed, slowly but surely, and Ottawa County, Oklahoma went from being the world's leader in lead and zinc production to being just another rural Oklahoma county pretty quick. Pitcher went from having around 14,000 people in the mid-1920s down to just about 2,500 by 1960, as the population kept dropping over the years. The last mine in Pitcher officially closed in 1967. Now, this is when water started to pool up in all of the closed mines, leaching toxic water into the watershed, as at this point, the water pumps that were operated by the mining companies no longer pumped out water to keep the shafts from flooding because the mines were closed. But we already went over what happened when the toxic water leached into the watershed. Fast forward to 1983 and the EPA created what is called the Tar Creek Superfund site in which cleanup is still ongoing today, 40 years later. The cleanup efforts are being made by federal, state, and local funds as the mining companies who were responsible for all of this mess no longer exist. Additionally, there's the Cherokee County Superfund site just north in Kansas along with a few other Superfund sites at former lead mining locations in Missouri. Today, the only life you'll find in Pitcher outside of the traffic passing through on US Highway 69 would be the dozens and dozens of dump trucks that are hauling off the chat that was left behind from all of the mining activity a century ago. Anyway, the Tar Creek Superfund site has long been considered to be the worst Superfund site in America, as in, no other Superfund site has caused more destruction to the environment than the one here in Pitcher. There were as many as 1,400 mine shafts in the area, in which 450 of them are thought to still be open shafts. Open as in, there's an opening into the ground at those locations, not open as in, being currently open for business. 
Anyway, there has been as many as 70 million tons of waste tailings within the giant chat piles throughout the area, and 36 million tons of mill sand and sludge. So you can see why it's taken 40 plus years to clean up everything that they've done so far, and it could take more than twice that amount of time before the job is completely done. Another problem is that throughout the town's entire existence, it's been common for sinkholes to swallow buildings in town and form on the streets as the ground throughout Pitcher was unpredictably unstable. And that's what made and still makes just being in Pitcher so dangerous because cave-ins here are so unpredictable as they could happen with little to no warning. I mean, if you're driving around in Pitcher as I was while I was filming for this video, or if you lived in Pitcher, or maybe you're just standing around in the city of Pitcher, at any given time, you could be on top of a carved out section of an old lead and zinc mine, or a cavity. There's a 12-ton limit on US Highway 69 through town because of the potential risks of a cave-in. Honestly, you would just be wise to avoid going through Pitcher at all, because if you've already seen it for yourself, then there's no other reason to just keep heading back, especially when you know the risks. A study in 2006 claimed that there were as many as 300 miles of underground mine shafts throughout the communities of Pitcher, Treese, and Cardin. Additionally, over the years, there's been a countless amount of people who grew up in Pitcher and have been sought out for interviews for news stories and documentaries. And in those stories, People have shared what their experience of living in Pitcher was like, including the fear of being the next victim of a random cave-in. People have also talked about how as kids, they would play on the giant piles of chat like it was a playground. When it snowed, kids would bring their sleds and they would slide down the slopes. Other people would bring their dirt bikes and treat these mounds like they were an off-road track. You know, people would act like these were sand dunes or something. Well, the wind would blow the toxic shavings everywhere throughout the town, and it would easily get tracked indoors on people's shoes. You know, Pitcher was the definition of a toxic town. It was also well documented that the children who grew up in Pitcher had elevated levels of lead in their blood, and today, we know what severe damage that can do to developing brains. The test scores at Pitcher High School were always below average, and the reasoning for that unquestionably, is because of the exposure that the town's residents had to lead. That being said, let's check out the former high school building, which is straight ahead. The Pitcher Carden Public School District officially closed after the 2008 and 2009 school year, in which the graduating class of 2009, yeah, it had only 11 students, and only 51 students were enrolled from grades 3 through 12. Kindergarten through third grade during the final year had already been phased out as the government buyouts, which first started in 2006, first targeted families that had young kids, which makes sense. Anyway, the former Pitcher High School building that we see here today was first completed in 1936, and it's safe to assume that it won't be standing for much longer. Well, in 2006, there were only 600 residents left collectively in the towns of Pitcher, Cardin, and Hawkerville. Once again, that's the year that the EPA began to offer buyouts of the remaining homes in these communities, with some people refusing the offer. Well, these residents reportedly were offered a fair market value for their home, and it gave anyone who didn't have the wealth to move out of town on their own an opportunity to be able to move away from the town that had a huge threat of cave-ins, sinkholes, and just an overall toxic environment. And most people took up the EPA on that offer. Also, many of the original pitcher prideful holdouts were able to be convinced through a sales pitch, although there were still a few that remained in the town. There's actually still some people who live in what used to be pitcher, still to this day, but not any more than you can count on one hand. Back in 2004, there was a study done on the tri-state area from the University of Kansas School of Medicine that showed how people who lived in this tri-state mining district were 20 to 30 percent more likely to obtain some diseases. But the most alarming stat from that study was how the chances for obtaining pneumoconiosis was 2,000 times more likely 
for a resident of the tri-state mining area than it was for the average American. Now, once again, that study was for the tri-state area, not Pitcher. And if it was a study that was done for just Pitcher residents, those numbers probably would have been a lot more extreme because Pitcher is really the only town where you see these giant piles of chat. Lastly, Pitcher never saw a happy ending, and it had nothing to do with the lead mining activity. It was more so Mother Nature and the fact that Pitcher is located within Tornado Alley. On May 10th, 2008, a mile-wide EF4 tornado blasted through the heart of Pitcher and tore apart more than 100 homes and other buildings, closing the book on the town's history for good. It unfortunately caused seven fatalities through its fierce 170-mile-per-hour winds. The town officially unincorporated in 2013, and nobody rebuilt after the tornado. Side note with that, because honestly, I feel like that could happen to many rural towns across America, especially in Kansas and Oklahoma, Nebraska, the Dakotas, the remote parts of Texas. All it will take is one massive tornado, and whether your town is a super fun site or not, if the economy doesn't justify rebuilding, I feel like this could easily happen to a lot of small rural towns across the country, where an EF4 or an EF5 could take out an entire town and we might not ever see a town in that particular spot ever again. Heck, it's already happened to quite a few towns in the Great Plains. Now, what are some of the more cultural things of note about Pitcher? Well, there's actually quite a few things to mention. Outside of the 10 or so viral YouTube videos made here over the last year, mine will probably be an afterthought since mine came later, but outside of YouTube videos, there's been quite a few professionally done documentaries on the town. I mean, it's an interesting story, so it's going to get attention like that. The Weather Channel came out and did an episode on Pitcher for their Storm Stories series. A PBS production called The Creek Runs Red was made on Pitcher, the name coming from the toxic metal tainted water that pools around in the area. A documentary called Tar Creek came out in 2009. Pitcher was on an episode of Forgotten Planet titled as Abandoned America on the Discovery Channel. In 2015, National Geographic came out with a segment called The Watch that featured one of the last remaining Pitcher holdouts and how he watches over the town. Yeah, that sounds kind of creepy and weird. Well, there's also an episode on the Science Channel series called What on Earth, where Pitcher was featured. So the story of this town definitely hasn't gone untold. More so, it might actually be overtold by people like me who are making YouTube videos on it. Well, at this point, we've seen a lot of what used to be the city of Pitcher, so... Let's transition to seeing some of the other neighboring ghost towns. This is Cardin. The water tower is still up, and so is a rather large building, which happened to be the post office. The grid street layout is blocked off from people like me wanting to come through, so you can only go through on this main stretch of road. You can see that there's still a remaining abandoned house on the opposite side of the street from the post office, along with the remaining infrastructure through utility lines and streets. Apparently, Cardin's claim to fame is being the hometown of Mickey Mantle's wife, Marilyn Mantle. Mickey is a Hall of Fame baseball player, as he was an all-time great with the New York Yankees, while Marilyn had success as an author. Mickey was born in a town quite a ways south called Spavanaugh, but when he was four, his family moved to Commerce, which is a town just south of Pitcher, while his dad worked in the lead and zinc mines in the area. But yeah, this is Marilyn Mantle's hometown, the wife of Mickey Mantle. Interesting stuff.
Another ghost town a few miles east of Pitcher and Cardin is a place called Hawkerville. The town had a post office from 1918 to 1963. Lead and zinc mining in Hawkerville gave the town as many as 1,500 residents during the 1920s. That, however, led to the same problems that Pitcher and Cardin faced, with cave-ins and sinkholes making the place dangerous to call home. In fact, in 1950 there was a large cave-in on Main Street, and that is largely what's credited for ending the town's existence. Now I didn't venture off onto the dirt streets, even though they weren't blocked off, but honestly, 99% of the buildings and remnants in Hawkerville are long gone, as this place became a ghost town in the 1960s. Several miles west of Hawkerville along the same county road, actually really close to Pitcher, is another ghost town called Zincville. Zincville used to be called St. Louis, and it was named after the St. Louis Melting and Refining Company, which operated several mines in the Pitcher area. Well, in 1919, the town's name was changed to Zincville after being founded in 1917. The last mine in Zincville closed in 1954, and after that, the town died. And there's really nothing left here. If you turn right down one of these roads, you might see something, but probably not. But this is where Zincville was. And of course, if you keep heading west down this road, it'll take you back to Pitcher, in which, during the winter, there can be some pretty chilling scenes in the ghost town of Pitcher, Oklahoma. Seven four three six zero, of course, on that signpost being the zip code of Pitcher, Oklahoma. Well, the last sizable ghost town that we're going to see in this video is Treese, Kansas, which was completely abandoned in 2012. The EPA offered government buyouts of the homes here in Treese, just like they did with Pitcher, and all but two of the former residents took the offer. When you combine the peak population for Treese, Pitcher, and Cardin, 
all three of these smaller communities combined to form a larger community that was home to about 20,000 people in the mid-1920s. In an interview with some remaining Treese residents by the New York Times in 2010 stated that kids from Treese would sometimes swim in the local ponds and end up with chemical burns all over their bodies. So yeah, don't go swimming in the ponds in the Tar Creek Superfund site, people. Obviously, they didn't know the dangers of that back then because nobody educated them on it and they just didn't know. But now you do. So don't do it, people. Final thoughts here as if for whether or not Pitcher is the largest ghost town in the United States, like my video title so claims, well, when you do a Google search for the largest ghost town in America, Google says that it's Jerome, Arizona. Now, I've never been to Jerome, Arizona, but a Google Street View snapshot of the downtown area in Jerome, Arizona makes it look more like a tourist town rather than a ghost town. Now, after you do that, Get back on Google Street View, head over to Pitcher, Oklahoma, and drop the weird orange guy anywhere within what used to be the city limits of Pitcher, and I guarantee you that you'll find no signs of human life anywhere other than dump trucks and cranes that are chipping away at the 200-foot high piles of toxic chat that's standing around everywhere. Anyway, point is that Jerome, Arizona looks nothing like a ghost town when you have all of the tourists and other people roaming around, plus... There's still a couple hundred people that call Jerome, Arizona home. And after doing other research on other ghost towns, all I found were other similar towns like Jerome, Arizona, that were old mining towns that have turned into tourist traps due to the overall ghost town vibes of those places. And I'd say that Pitcher, Oklahoma easily qualifies as the largest true ghost town in the United States. And it helps that you have other neighboring ghost towns such as Treese, Kansas, Cardin, Zincville, and a few others to make this whole area just feel like one large abandoned town. Well, with that said, I do end the video here. And do me a favor, as if you enjoyed this video, make sure to drop a like, comment, and subscribe if you haven't already, as doing all of those things helps these videos destroy the evil monster that is the YouTube algorithm. Also, make sure to hit that notification bell so that you can be notified every time that I upload a new video. If you enjoyed this video, then you might enjoy checking out some of the featured playlists on this channel. Videos with amazing insights on other places like what you saw here can be found in my Ghost Towns playlist, my USA Small Towns playlist, my Oklahoma playlist, or in my Kansas playlist. Last but not least, if you can't get enough of me on here, you can always go follow me on my other social media accounts, and those links are below. We'll see you next time. Peace!